Your Royal Highness, Minister, County Governor, Mayor, Laureates, Your Excellencies, guests and friends of the University. On behalf of the University of Bergen, I am grateful for the privilege to welcome you all to this year's Holberg Prize and Nils Klim Prize Award Ceremony. The Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize were established by the Norwegian government in 2003, that is 20 years ago with the goal of recognizing internationally leading scholars in the fields of the humanities, social sciences, law, and theology. The importance of the academic disciplines covered by these prizes can hardly be under, uh, overstated. They teach us about the human world from critical perspectives. They give us a sense of our shared history, of where we are coming from, and where we are headed. And they also question our history by rediscovering it and translating it into our own time. The university is an old institution, but it is a young community. At UIB alone, more than 20,000 students spend many of their formative years. It is a huge responsibility. It is a huge joy, and it is an enormous honor for us to be the chosen home, the village, for such a large number of young adults. They come here to learn and to study, they come here to pursue their dreams, to learn about themselves and to grow. And also to understand the complexity of the world that surrounds them. To study is a project of freedom. The really important kind of freedom that involves awareness and attention towards the society and towards ourselves and also self-discipline. The freedom to think critically and freely. Universities are places that bring the old and the new together, the young and the old. And this is the world in which the fields of the Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize exist. We are living in exceptional times our world seems different than it did just a decade ago. There is a devastating war in Europe, the existential threat of the climate change and the biodiversity looms large, and our societies are changing. The Western societies are aging, and we have to keep up with the fast development of artificial intelligence. For a democratic, liberating and sustainable future, the fields covered by the Holberg Prize are fundamental. This is a time for fundamental questions to be asked about the societies we share and the values and the social structures that underpin them, about our history that is ever-changing, ever to be reinterpreted over and over again. And today we will celebrate the great contributions of two scholars. Two scholars that both work in and on conceptualizing a different world. Holberg Prize winner, Professor Jean Martinez Allier and his groundbreaking research in ecological economics political ecology and environmental justice. And Nils Klim Prize winner Simona Setterberg Nielsen for her research in the history of the genre of the novel, its narrative structure and its fictionality. Thank you so much for your attention and again heartily welcome.
Your Royal Highness, Minister, Laureates, Your Excellencies, guests and friends from Norway and abroad. Welcome to the award ceremony for the Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize. Today, we are pleased to honor and celebrate the 2023 laureates, Juan Martinez Olier and Simona Setteberg Nielsen. And as chair of the Holberg Board, it is my great privilege to guide you through this award ceremony. We are gathered in the University Aula in Bergen, the home of the Holberg Prize, where we will celebrate these outstanding laureates who have made groundbreaking contributions to research in academic fields that are covered by the Holberg Prize and the Niels Klim Prize. The Holberg Prize <coughs> was established by the Norwegian Parliament in 2003. Thus, we are very delighted to also celebrate the 20 year anniversary of the prize this year. The prize is administered by the University of Bergen on behalf of the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research. Every year, two prizes are awarded in the academic fields of the humanities, social sciences, law and theology. The main Holberg Prize and the Niels Klim Prize. The prizes are awarded by the board on behalf of the University of Bergen and on the recommendation of academic committees, which consist of outstanding scholars in the relevant academic fields. And we would like to extend our great thanks to the valuable work undertaken by these committees. Now, one of the main ambitions of the Holberg Prize is to inspire and engage young scholars and to promote dialogue across different generations of researchers. The Niels Klim Prize is therefore awarded annually to a young researcher under 35 years of age from or in a Nordic country. The prize is named after Ludwig Holberg's young hero in his novel Niels Klim's Underground Travels from 1741. And the value of the prize is 500,000 Norwegian kroner. So, on behalf of the University of Bergen and on the recommendation of the Niels Klim Committee, it is now my great pleasure to announce that the board of the Holberg Prize has decided that this year's Niels Klim Prize shall be awarded to Simona Setteberg Nielsen. Simona Setteberg Nielsen is Associate Professor of Scandinavian Studies at the Faculty of Arts at Aarhus University, Denmark. The Nils Klim Committee notes that she pursued her university education at Aarhus University, completing her PhD degree in 2017 with the dissertation Fictionality and the Formation of the Novel, with a focus on the invention of 18th century Danish fiction. While Aarhus University has been her academic base, she has been a visiting student and later visiting scholar at academic institutions in Europe, Australia, and in the USA. Setteberg Nielsen ha has also been an active participant in international scholarly collaboration, especially in the areas of narratology, the history of the novel, and fictionality. Now, throughout her academic career, Setteberg Nielsen has been prolific on several academic fronts, teaching and supervising, editing journals and books, and organizing conferences, as well as giving lectures and publishing in both English and Danish, a bilingual activity which is exemplary in itself. Setteberg Nielsen's achievement has been acknowledged with Aarhus University's award for best PhD dissertation in the humanities and with a number of substantial postdoctoral grants, and most recently with an, with an Inge Lehmann grant to establish a research group entitled The Science of Fiction, How Fiction Shaped Science and Science Shaped Fiction. Much of Setteberg Nielsen's scholarly work has centered around the concept of fictionality and its various implications and manifestations. Now, unlike the term literariness, which has been important in demarcating the specificity of literature and its expressiveness, fictionality 
has in recent scholarship come to designate the relation of literature to lived reality, the world of individual and social experiences. This entails that fictionality exists in dialectical relation to factuality. Setterberg Nielsen has fruitfully explored the ways in which the concept has been applied by her predecessors, and she has wielded it masterfully in her own studies of both individual texts and a larger corpora, most notably the 18th century Danish novel in its entirety. She has also approached the concept theoretically, analyzing its rhetorical, communicative aspects and its pragmatic, context-dependent relevance. Fictionality, as she points out, is not limited to literary discourse, for it plays a vital role in everyday conversation. And she is now turning her attention to the ways in which it pertains to science. The broad relevance of her impressive scholarship is highlighted by one of the key predicaments of all times. The, the unreliability of mankind's ever-broadening technical modes of communication. Simona Setterberg Nielsen is the most worthy recipient of the 2023 Nils Klim Prize. And I would now like to ask Minister of Higher Education and Research, Ola Borten Moe, and Simona Setterberg Nielsen to join me on stage, where the minister will confer this year's Nils Klim Prize on Associate Professor Sima Setterberg Nielsen. Highness Crown Prince Hokan, Minister Ole Borden Mo, Your Excellencies, Madam Rector Margaret Hain, Hoburg Prize Laureate Johan Martinet Allier, the Hoburg Prize Committee, the Nils Klim Committee, friends, family, and colleagues. It is hard to express what a great honor it is to stand here today and join the Nils Klim Laureates. I want to show my deep-filled gratitude to the Nils Klim Committee for awarding me the prize. And I wish to extend my thankfulness to Bjorn Inge Bertelsen for facilitating the prize ceremony and for assuring me that it was not a prank when he first called me <laughs> to tell me that I would be the 2023 recipient. A reassurance which at first made me think that it was maybe a prank. But I'm standing here today, and it's possible for me to also thank Jan Seierstel for reading my work with such careful precision. That has been an honor in itself. To Ole Sandmo for making the Holberg and Nils Klim Prize visible in the press, and to Ellen Hetta and my parents for making it possible to travel here to Bern with my son Samuel, who has just turned eight months. I want to express my gratefulness, not only for receiving the prize, but for the Holberg Week as a whole and for what it stands for, a celebration of science and the humanities. I also want to use the opportunity to honor the founders of the Niels Klim Prize and as a serious just the name of the prize. One might have expected an Erasmus Montanus Prize or a Jeppe of the Hill Prize, after some of Holberg's most known comedies, while a Nils Klim Prize is a more surprising, but nevertheless well-chosen name. The characters Erasmus Montanus, Jeppe of the Hill, and Nils Klim have in common that they are confused as to their own competences, or lack thereof. And in Holberg's works, the audience or reader is invited to laugh at those who lack self-awareness, which is likely to include the reader. 
So when we celebrate in the name of Holberg, we also celebrate humor. And an important part of the genius of Holberg's humor is that it is a mixture of jest and seriousness. A mixture of jest and seriousness were the exact words Holberg used when describing his novel Nilsklim. I am in the exceptional position today that the very book after which the prize is named plays a central role in my research. I have studied the rise of the Danish novel and a key research object in my work is Nils Klim. So today I wish to give three good reasons for why the name, the Nils Klim Prize, is so well chosen. Nils Klim is unique, first, because it is one of the very first Scandinavian novels ever written and a central piece in the rise of modern fiction. Secondly, because it presents enlightenment ideas about the value of well-conducted science. And thirdly, because it does so by establishing a witty opposition to misinformation, superstition, and what we might today call fake news. In his third Leonisbrev from 1743, Horbeck clarifies the aim of Nils Klim. In my translation, it reads, at home in Norway, you will find a number of people of both sexes who speak boldly of their intercourse with trolls and goblins, and who swear on their soul that the underworldly have abducted them to hills and mountain caves. These foolish people who have given substance and content to my novel are made into a laughing stock in its hero, Nils Klim. With his fictional novel, Nils Klim, Holbeck wanted to ridicule superstition and promote science. In my research, I've argued that modern fiction and science arose with Holbeck and his contemporaries in the 18th century, and that the two were not opposites, but in many respects sustained and constituted each other. Seeking the roots of our modern understanding of science, fact, and fiction constitutes the core of my research. And Holbeck's novel is one of the protons of that core, as it plays a vital role for the rise of science and fiction in Scandinavia. The character Nils Klim is not just a perfect anti-hero of 1741 when the novel was first published but also of 2023. I have made 18th century novels as Nils Klim my subject area, not just for the interest in history itself, but also for the answers to the present and the future that may lie hidden in the past, and I believe we should continue to dig for them. A celebration in the name of Holberg's Nils Klim is therefore a celebration of historical beginnings, of science and fiction, and of resistance to misinformation and superstition. So I could not be prouder to be the recipient of a prize with that name. My research depends on collective efforts. I'm forever grateful to the many research communities who have embraced me. My wonderful and generous colleagues and friends at Aarhus University and around the world. In the Societies for the Study of the 18th Century, Fictionality and Narrative at the Departments of Literature at Aarhus University, Ohio State University, and York University, where some of my closest collaborators reside. But most of all, I'm overwhelmed by the never-ending sparing collaboration and support, professionally and personally, I have received from Henrik Sederberg Nielsen, my husband. He taught me that research happens together, like all other good things in the world. And I've never met anyone as generous as Henrik, who has made everything possible. So thus, let us continue our fight against those who speak boldly of their intercourse with trolls and goblins together. Thank you.
The Holberg Prize is awarded annually to a scholar who has made outstanding contributions to research in the humanities, social sciences, law, and theology, either in one discipline or through interdisciplinary work. The laureate must have had a decisive influence on international research. And the value of the prize is 6 million Norwegian kroner. Now, on behalf of the University of Bergen and on the recommendation of the Holberg Committee, the board of the Holberg Prize has decided that this year's Holberg Prize goes to Professor Juan Martinez Allier. Juan Martinez Allier is professor at the Department of Economics and Economic History, Universitat Autonoma Barcelona. The Holberg Committee points out that Juan Martinez Allier is a world leading scholar of ecological economics, political ecology, and environmental justice. His transdisciplinary research integrates social and natural sciences, proposing a humanities-driven form of economics. Martinez Allier is highly influential in several fields. These range from anthropology, geography, environmental studies, and political economy, to agrarian studies, and the analysis of food systems. He's a major figure and leading public intellectual in the burgeoning movement for degrowth and agroecology. Analytically clear, his critiques of mainstream economic theory raise questions about the dominant focus on economic growth as the sole metric of a good economy. His approach rejects economic models based on extracting resources from the environment to support material accumulation and consumption. Instead, his economic framework centers on human and environmentally flourishing development, creating an alternative, pluralistic theory of value for determining economic judgments. The empirical basis of his theory draws on extensive and long-term research conducted in a variety of global contexts. Based on participatory research methods, his analysis emerges from dialogue with indigenous and non-Western forms of life and knowledge. A central concern of Martinez Allier's work is how environmental questions are inseparable from analysis of historical injustices and ongoing inequalities. These injustices raise questions concerning the ecological debt that so-called developed nations owe formerly colonized countries. Two of his most influential books are Ecological Economics, Energy, Environment and Society with Klaus Schlüppmann from 1987 and The Environmentalism of the Poor, a study of ecological conflicts and valuation from 2002. Ecological economics traces the history of ecologi ecological critiques of economics from the 1860s to the 1940s. And the book was a major catalyst in the development of political ecology through its articulation of a different tradition of economic thought. The environmentalism of the poor examines the relationship between environmental conflicts and poverty. This book overturns assumptions that there is a necessary conflict between improving the economic well-being of the poor and attaining environmental sustainability. Martina Salier is a founding member of the International Society for Ecological Economics. He also founded the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology at the Universitat Autonoma of Barcelona. The Institute is a multidisciplinary center promoting the study of the nature and causes of environmental problems and seeks constructive policies that enable transition to a sustainable economy. A key part of its work is the Environmental Justice Atlas that documents environmental justice struggles around the world. And then Martinez Allier, 
he has the unusual distinction of both anticipating and actively engaging with the inter interrelated planetary challenges of poverty, climate change, and food security. His innovative theories of mentor and, and mentorship continue to build the capacity of new scholars and policymakers to address these interesting crises of global economic life. The Holberg Committee concludes that Joan Martinez Allier is undoubtedly a highly worthy recipient of the 2023 Holberg Prize. And I would now like to ask His Royal Highness, Crown Prince Håkon, and Professor Joan Martinez Allier to join me on stage, where the Crown Prince will confer this year's Holberg Prize on Professor Joan Martinez Allier. He'll get some water. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this honor. And your Royal Highness, Grand Prince Prince, <coughs> Prince Hakon, Minister all aboard and more, distinguished audience, Madame Recto Margaret Hagen, Daniel Klims Lauret, Simona Setterberg, that we have seen each other quite often this week, the Holberg Prize Board and the committees, and all of you who are some of my own family, colleagues, and friends. This uh, generous award from the Holberg Committee and the board places, and I see it as a collective prize, places ecological economics and political ecology, and also the debates on post-growth or degrowth in the academic spotlight, because this is an important prize internationally, and nearer, nearer to the center of politics. The Holberg Prize statement that we had in part says that the aim of my research is to show that economic growth and changes in the flows of energy and materials, this is on the one side, and the growing number of ecological injustices and conflicts are two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, the growth of the economy means more energy, more materials, changes also in the composition of these energy materials, and this is a cause, the main cause, in my view, of the many environmental conflicts around the world. Our main purpose, which is also a collective purpose of my research groups and institute in Barcelona, but it's much wider than this, is indeed to make visible the many environmental conflicts that exist, which are, as I said, connected to the changes in the real, real economy, as I suggested, that is in the material flows and the energy flows. This actual, this clash between economy and environment has been quite often hidden, or there have been attempts 
to hit it, to dissimulate it, by a consensus on sustainable development, which I think rather, I see myself and other people, as a contradiction in terms, because you cannot have economic growth, and at the same time, this to be sustainable. This started, actually, with deep roots in Norway and many other places, but also in Norway because of the Brunnen Commission in 1987. And this has been prolonged by the Sustainable Development Goals, which are really praiseworthy and very well thought out, except the number eight of the Sustainable Development Goals says that we all in the United Nations, as members of the states of the United Nations, should believe in further economic growth. If you read or reread Sustainable Development Goal number eight, you will see this very explicitly. Well, I disagree with this, or ecological economists, we tend to disagree with this, or we agree only partially with these ideas of uh, sustainability, which go together with a belief in further economic growth. In fact, we to explain, to, to speak plainly, we disagree with this because of, of empirical reasons. But what is happening now over the last year, as the rector said, is that international democratic limitations on the views of the environment are made impossible by increasing inequalities and because of unleashed state power, at least by some states. Effective agreement that we thought against reality, actually, that the many cops along the years since the year 92, isn't it, would do something in practice about climate change and uh, biodiversity loss. But this was hopes, more or less realistic, modern realities, but now it's even worse, isn't it? Over the last year, what is happening is that agreements to prevent these environmental damages are less likely than ever in this new age of empires and possible regional nuclear wars. I hope, however, that the impulse to do something about the state of the world the environment and the economy and the political uh, debates and, and clashes and possible wars, the hope remains that civil society, grassroots movements from civil society, and in particular the world environmental justice movement can be an instrument, can be do something about this uh, coming sort of bad period and can do something because uh, there is, it is a strong movement, together with feminism, together perhaps with the peace movement, the social, uh, we know that the world has changed quite often because of civil society movements, including the anti-coloniality movement, anti-racist movement, and other social movements, but I am focusing on the environmental justice movement. It is a great honor to receive this award, which was also granted, I'd say, some names of the Holbert Prize because they feel so satisfied to be in their company. And some of them are alive uh, still. Jürgen Habermas, Bruno Latour, whom I know, but he's dead. Honora O'Neill, Cass Sustain, Manuel Castells, whom I know since we were both 22, 23 years old in, against the... Against, uh, trying to bring General Franco down without much success, and in the 60s already. <laughs> and uh, I'm very glad that we both got this prize. Paul Gilroy, Griselda Pollock, Marta Nussbaum, Sheila Yasanov, and others. This company fills me with satisfaction. I was born, as I said, mentioning Manuel Castells. I was born in Barcelona in the fateful year of uh, 1939, which was also a very bad year for <laughs> Norway and for the rest of Europe, but of course for Catalonia and for Spain was especially, or I mean, was bad, but it lasted longer than in other places. And uh, I left for some years to go to um, abroad and I worked in Rueda Ibérico in Paris, which was an exile uh, publishing house 
and then I was for 10 years in Oxford, in St. Anthony's College, and I want to, I am still grateful to this institution in the mid-60s until the mid-70s. When I went back to Barcelona, I became professor of economic history or economic institutions and history after writing several books when I was at Oxford on agrarian issues in southern Spain, in Andalusia, in Cuba, and also in Peru. And I learned a lot in Peru. I think that uh, it has been mentioned by by the Holbrook Committee that I was working sometimes with local activists, and I believe in this in this scholar uh, activism research, activist, scholar activism research. This school. Well, I already did this from very early on, precisely in Peru, looking at the struggles about haciendas and shepherds and so on at the time of the land reform in the early 1970s. Later on, I became more interested in purely ecological issues, and particularly in the context or the lack of contact between the studies on energy and mainstream economics, because econom mainstream economics did not study energy, and they do not study energy, in especially in every year, they only study energy when there is an energy crisis, like in the 70s, or now again with the Ukraine war. But you cannot study the economy if you do not understand the material and energy basis of the industrial economy, isn't it? I think that the students of economics should start by studying the, real, the ecological realities before this, they do the study of markets and prices. So I also founded another thing, apart the, the International Society for Ecological Economics, which was a collective endeavor also. I founded a journal, which is called in Spanish Ecología Política, Political Ecology, already in 1990, and it's still going on. Our research in political ecology related to ecological economics, our research shows that the common people are often at the forefront in the defense of the environment against destructive industry. And sometimes they are killed by this. La Chico Mendes was killed in Acre, Brazil in, in 1988, fighting deforestation and fighting also beef production, meat production for export, which is a big sector now in Brazil, based on the deforestation of the Amazon. Ken Saroviva and eight or nine of his companions were killed in 1995 in Nigeria because of the opposition to oil extraction by the Shell Company. Coming, there are so many that I would spend two hours listing the people that we know that have been killed as in this movement, which we call the environmentalists of the poor and the indigenous, and which is not an environmentalist, so to speak, of the rich countries of people worried as they should be worried or we should be worried about what happens with the whales or the polar bears and other types of uh, environmental uh, topics, isn't it? This environmental of the poor and the indigenous is very much based on defense of the territories against destructive industries. Here I also listed Berta Cáceres, that we might know you, some of you probably remember, against hydropower uh, a few years ago in Honduras, or Gloria Capitan, that perhaps not so many people have heard about, in the Philippines in, in 2016, or Fikile in Atsangase in South Africa in 2020. These last two, two women, but three women I've mentioned, uh, these last two in conflicts against the coal industry in the Philippines as a coal-fired power plant, and in South Africa against coal extraction. So these movements, these environmentalists of the poor and the indigenous, are not just uh, 
social, interesting, agrarian or urban movements of people who are discontent with, with the realities they suffer, the social realities plus the environmental damage, they have a, an historical meaning because, well, fighting against coal extraction is relevant for or against climate change, isn't it? And the other examples I gave are the same. When Chico Mende defended the Amazon, the Amazon territory for his own interest, material interest on his group, material interest is a rubber tapas in Acre in Brazil, he was at the same time, well, he was not at the beginning, he realized he was an environmentalist who was defending the Amazon that, as we know, is a big, or used to be, a big carbon sink, although now it's becoming a carbon dioxide producing territory because of deforestation. So, all this happens to go back to the material and energy realities because the economy is not circular at all. The economy is increasingly entropic. Entropic means that we cannot use energy twice and we cannot use materials, we can recycle to some extent materials, but only to some extent in practice. So of all the materials and energy that go into the economy, which I yesterday I explained are about 100 billion tons per year of the fossil fuels, biomass, metals, the sand, the gravels, and so on, like 12 tons per person per year, only about one ton is recycled at present. Therefore, I repeat, the economy is not circular. The real economy, it is entropic. Entropic comes from the law of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, and from the book of Jusjesko Regen of 71, called The Entropy Law and the Economic Process, which is a, a text which is behind the whole uh, group or movement or, or scientific enterprise of ecological economics. And even without economic growth, even without economic growth, the economy, the world economy, or the world industrial economy, whether it's from China or Europe or the US, would have to advance, as it is doing all the time, towards the commodity extraction frontiers, because if the recycling is only 10%, it means that next year we need, we, we, I say we, the industrial economy needs to go to these frontiers for new extraction. And we see this also in this country as we see it in Sweden or in Finland with new copper and nickel mining or new extraction of oil and gas. Not only here, but all around the Arctic, isn't it? The others, which has been mentioned, of environmental justice, and which is one of the motives of the Holberg Prize given to me, and it's not an individual enterprise at all, because we have now nearly 4,000 uh, sort of pages in the others, and each page has like uh, six or eight real pages with description, uh, with coded variables, with, with some photographs, some material explaining the individual conflicts. So if this was the work of one person, this person at one, at one case per week should, be, should live about 120 years. And, it? and this is very unlikely. If a, a group of persons, of 12 persons, should live many years. So this has been done by about 100 people, some entering two cases, some entering uh, 100 cases, perhaps in some cases, in some, for some persons. So this is the Alliance of Environmental Justice with 4,000 cases, entries at present. And this allows to do comparative statistical political ecology, including a couple of articles published this week, one in Nature Sustainability and the other in Science yesterday evening, came out by Arnim Scheidel and a collection of about 12 people. And this is about, this article is called Using the Aldas they study the impacts of destructive industries in indigenous territories around the world, including some near, near here, more or less, but of course, all in, around the world. 
and needs something which is an article which is going to be very much quoted, I think. In these conflicts, what we see is that diverse values are being expressed. Economic values, sacredness, indigenous territorial rights, also economic values. These plural values are not commensurate, are not commensurate, commensurate among themselves. You cannot translate one to the other. The units of measurement, assuming that you can measure the units of sacredness, but you can say that something is very sacred or not very sacred, according to the local people, or that something is economically very valuable or not, but among themselves cannot be reduced one to the other. And instead, a social scientists, people who do environmental impact assessment, the people who are in the courts, the judges, should apply rather like what we call technically a multi-criteria evaluation, looking at things from different points of view, and then coming, if they are judges, coming to a sort of decision which perhaps is going to be appealed. For instance, you have famous cases in this country on the Alta Riva conflict um, years ago about the dam or now to the fossil, fossil wind, windmill conflicts, but you also have conflicts on mining. You have the Lofoten Islands case, which as I understand it, and I hope I'm not mistaken, it has been decided to leave, at least for a while, the oil or the gas under the, the, the sea, isn't it? And, and so on. So these cases are just, uh, I don't want to show knowledge of Norway, which obviously is not very great, but these cases are in the others, so one can go to the others and see how we have managed the entries into these cases, but also they show what I'm talking about now, that there are many values in dispute. And who has the power, one could ask, who has the political power to determine that some of these values are more important than the other values, isn't it? And who has the power also to, to make believe that uncertainty about the effects has been dispelled and that we know what is going to happen, we can give a money value of what is going to happen and do a cost-benefit analysis with the rate of discount that we could be 5% or 3% to talk more about economic issues, no, or 0%, why not? Uh, uh, two years ago, three years ago, a Nobel Prize, or so-called Nobel Prize in Economics, was given to North House from Yale, because it has been for a long time trying to stop, well, I'm going to simplify, trying to stop uh, public policies against climate change with economic reasoning in which he tried to show that the cost of doing something now would be very large, the benefits are future benefits, perhaps they are larger than, but if we discount the future benefits on the assumption that there is going to be economic growth, that economists have as a kind of religion, therefore future benefits discounted come to very little, less than the present cost of doing something, therefore we should not do anything. To get a Nobel Prize for this, I think is a bit, uh, is not a very good idea. And he has been criticized before the Nobel Prize and after the Nobel Prize. It would have been better, in my view, to escape this economic logic and look at it from a multi criteria point of view. Coming back to what I said about the victims of um, the extractive industries, what we see is that this idea, which also is mentioned in the Halbert Prize um, text, this idea of the environmentalists of the poor and the indigenous was new when we proposed it with Ramachandra Guha from India, and I've met many with him in the 90s. We wrote a book together in 1997. He had been studying the Chipko movement, the Himalaya, as a doctoral thesis, in which women and men in Uttarakhand, in the western Himalaya in India, were stopping the cutting of trees by the commercial industry. The British had nationalized the 
forests in India, but then it became back to the communities, but then commercial interests were interested in some of these trees. And the local people stopped the cutting of the trees, not because they were environmentalists or they were, they were not probably even hurt about Greenpeace, isn't it, in the 70s, in the Himalaya, the local people in the villages, but because of material interest, but also because of principles of their own values about uh, the landscape, the, the sacredness, perhaps in some cases, the gender issue, because the women were more on the vanguard of this kind of protest. So this was the book by Ramachandra Guha, published in 89, and I have been working in Latin America, where I have spent a large part of my life on similar cases in, about mangroves, about uh, all things, kinds of similar situations in several countries. And we both came to this idea together with Victor Toledo in Mexico, other people, Bina Garbal, also in India, we came to this idea of the environmentalists of the poor and the indigenous who went against um, important hypotheses in political science that the environmentalists were something that came with economic affluence. When people already had two cars in the garage and, and needed enough money to travel by plane and so on, then they became, perhaps, this was Ronald Inglehart, uh, hypothesis called the post-materialist change in cultural values in Europe or the U.S. after 68, uh, they became worried about many issues, human rights, the environment, self-expression, things like this. This, Ronald Inger had people in the here who are political sociologists, political scientists or sociologists, know this very well as the post-political hypothesis that we criticized because the environmental movement in rich countries in the 60s and 70s in part was an anti-nuclear energy movement, not in this country, but in Germany clearly so, in the States also, isn't it? In California and many after female island accident in the States in 79, isn't it? There was a strong anti-nuclear movement in, in Europe and the US and now, and, and this movement, well, was concerned about very material issues because nuclear radiation is a very material issue and you don't see it very, uh, with our eyes, but it kills people and animals and everything. Therefore, this was a misnomer as we wrote. This post-materialist was wrong for the North and post-materialist was even more wrong for the South movements in that are movements that defend their own livelihoods. They are not sometimes explicitly environmentalists, even in the 70s and 80s, they didn't know the world, uh, but who in practice they are. And they also, I think now we could say that they are uh, favorable to the growth of the economy, but not because they have heard or read uh, Latouche or read any of the authors about the croissants in France or anything like this, but because of practice, isn't it? They, they, they practice the growth in practice when they stop pipelines, like the Dakota pipelines in the US, indigenous people, but so many other examples in Africa or in Latin America or in Southeast Asia. So this is what we criticize then against Ronald Inglehart, and we also criticize since we are discussing social sciences because of the, of the Holberg uh, Prize is about theology and law, but also social sciences. We also criticize Ulrich Beck, who after Chernobyl published a book saying that uh, environmental risk was uh, class, social class neutral, which is true. If you think of a disaster like Chernobyl, the radiation went to Western Europe and Eastern Europe and so on, and did not distinguish between black and white or rich and poor or women or men. The radiation uh, killed indifferently to, and this would be the case for other catastrophes, for instance, uh, nature made or human made or both together. But this applies to some cases, but does not apply in general. In general, environmental damage 
is not neutral socially. And uh, this is another idea that we have been trying to modify. So, to finish, all this has given, uh, from the point of view of university, work and organization, both the EG Atlas and also in Barcelona, the fact that now there is something that uh, is called the Barcelona School of Ecological Economics and Political Ecology. I don't know whether it really exists or not, whether it's fact or fiction, to the, but it's fact in the sense that there is a book published recently with this title, but not by me, by some colleagues uh, who have written like 33 chapters about this, of ecological anthropology, uh, environmental history, agroecology, urban ecology, ecological economics, and political ecology under this title, Barcelona School, well, which is as a kind of homage to ourselves in a way in Barcelona and to this institute that has been mentioned, the ICTA UAB. I also have, uh, I am going to publish a book this year, which is called, I mentioned this yesterday, Land, Water, Air, and Freedom, and the subtitle is environmental, the making of environmental justice movements in the world, but also, and with this I will finish, uh, three or four years ago I published a book of memoirs, but only in Catalan, because I was not very sure about this book, so I took refuge, as you do probably here sometimes, and you were doing this morning, refuge in your own culture and language to see what happens with these memoirs. And, and <clears throat> And the book has a title in Catalan called Dama sera un altra dia, meaning tomorrow will be another day, which is a very boring title, but comes from a song by Chico, another Chico, not Chico Mendes, but Chico Buarque, who was a singer in Brazil in the 60s and 70s, and has a book which starts, is a samba, isn't it? A mañá va ser otro día. Y a mañá va ser otro día, he sang against the military regime in Brazil in the 60s and even the 70s. And, and it, was, it, was the, it passed the censorship because the military thought it was a love song. A mañá will be another day, a song to a girl uh, in saying, we have broken up, but tomorrow will be another day. But it was not about the love affair. It was against the military telling the military, your days are counted. Tomorrow will be another day, and there is going to be a grande euphoria, no? A great euphoria. So this song, I remember, I could sing it now if I, if I, if I had the abilities and the voice for it. As you see, I have not got a very good voice for singing, but it influenced me, and this is the title of my memoirs, which I hope will come soon in a second edition, and also in English, I hope, because there is a text already in English. And in this second edition, I'm going to add some anecdotes from this trip to Bergen, actually, and to Norway, and the Holberg Prize, because this is what makes the memoirs lively. Not a spicy anecdotes, but some more academic anecdotes or some. And, and not because I have just to reiterate my, my thanks to you, my gratitude. In these days, was well, since I got the notice of the of the prize through this uh, telephone call, isn't it? In my case, it was through uh, internet on the 6th of February. Then I had been doing studies of Holberg, and I mean amateur studies of Holberg, and the city of Brennan, and the history of Norway, and also listening, as we listen a short time back to, by the pianist, the, the, the Holberg suite by Greek, isn't it? So Holberg and Greek and Ibsen, of course, which I already know and so on, I have revived some of this knowledge and I have learned a lot from here during these days. And I also have learned something through Simone mainly about the literary use of Danish and Norwegian in Holberg's time and about the process of Norway independence in 1905, which is really very interesting, and the process perhaps of Greenland independence soon or not, with a great environmental context in it. So if one travels around the world, one learns something, if one keeps one eyes open and ears. Thank you again for this prize and this opportunity, as I say sometimes, to expand my ignorance and to learn new things also. Thank you very much.